Alleluia. Christ is risen. May his grace and peace be with you. Glory be to God on high, and in earth peace, goodwill towards all. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, take us away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord, thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Lord of life and power, through the mighty resurrection of your Son, you have overcome the old order of sin and death and have made all things new in him. May we, being dead to sin and alive to you in Jesus Christ, reign with him in glory, who with you and the Holy Spirit is alive, one God, now and forever. Amen. This reading is from Acts 3, verses 1 to 10. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, at three o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate, so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. The word of the Lord. We will now read together Psalm 105. <clears throat> Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Remember the marvels he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. He is the Lord our God. His judgments prevail in all the world. The covenant he made with Abraham, the oath that he swore to Isaac.
The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. While he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of Christ. And to God be the glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's Gospel is much the longest of the post-Easter stories in the Gospels. Jesus and two disciples on the road to Emmaus. I'll restrict myself to a few highlights. First, the two disciples. They're not of the original 12. One, we're told, is named Cleopas. The other is unnamed. You heard how at the end of their journey, they invite Jesus to stay with them. That suggests the two disciples have arrived at their home, which in turn suggests they're a couple, Cleopas and his wife. There may be a further clue to her identity. 
Cleopas is a variant of the name Clopas. In St. John's account of the Passion, a group of women are gathered at the foot of the cross, among them Mary, the wife of Clopas. In our text, then, likely Cleopas and his wife Mary. The two are on their way home from Jerusalem. Almost certainly they're amongst those drawn to the Holy City for the Passover festivities, which, as you know, coincided with Jesus' last days. Sunday after Passover was when the pilgrims returned to their homes. Cleopas and Mary, Passover pilgrims and followers of Jesus, are walking the seven miles to their hometown of Emmaus. As they walk, they're trying to come to terms with all that's happened in the past few days. Of a sudden, Jesus joins them, and we have our first mystery. They don't recognize him. Or rather, as St. Luke tells it, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. What kept them from recognizing him? The trauma and catastrophe of the past three days? Grief? Unbelief? One is reminded of Mary's mistaking Jesus for the gardener at the empty tomb, and of the hesitancy of the disciples to believe that the risen Christ was more than a ghost. Jesus asks Cleopas and his wife what they're talking about. His question stops them in their tracks, their appearance downcast, even sullen. Cleopas responds with a question of his own. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have taken place there in these days? The irony is palpable for us who know the identity of the stranger. Jesus is, after all, the only one who really knows what's taken place. Nothing daunted, Jesus inquires, what things? And we have our second mystery. What's Jesus playing at? Why not stop the charade and identify himself? I've said it before. One of the hardest tasks Jesus faced was persuading his friends and followers that he had indeed risen from the dead. And if contemporary preaching and scholarship's anything to go by, it continues to be an almost impossible task. Ingenious compromises are on offer in spades. Anything but the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead, in spite of its being the clear testimony of a straightforward reading of the Gospels. But back to our mystery. Why doesn't Jesus make himself known to this couple straight away? Is it because he knows he must overcome their almost insurmountable prejudice against seeing a dead man alive again? Is it out of compassion, not ignoring or riding roughshod, but acknowledging and respecting so as finally to relieve their unutterable grief and disillusionment? Or again, is it to allow time for the impossible reality of his resurrection to make itself felt at subconscious and even intuitive levels before finally and indubitably identifying himself. The two respond to the stranger's what things with a rehearsal of the facts about Jesus. It might well have served for the model for the second paragraph of our creed. His teachings, miracles, trial, and crucifixion, and even that morning's astounding report of his empty tomb and angelic visitations. It's all there, but recited not as a confession of faith, but nostalgically in sorrow, disappointment, and bewilderment. We had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. The last phrase in their rehearsal of the facts is the most poignant, albeit also the most delightfully ironic. Various people have reported seeing the empty tune and the angelic visitors, but verse 24, him they saw not. Him who now walks in plain sight alongside these two on the road to Emmaus. Their mood is not lost on Jesus. It's time for him to take the upper hand which he does with some gusto. Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe. 
In what does their stubborn unbelief consist? In their not hearing, verse 25, all that the prophets have declared, namely, verse 26, that the Messiah must suffer these things and then enter into his glory. The great stumbling block to faith in Christ is the cross. And even Christian preachers have succumbed. I read a sermon recently in which the congregation was exhorted to forget about Good Friday and Easter and to focus on the Jesus who walked the lanes of Galilee, caring for people along the way. No stumbling block there. But that's the unbelief that Jesus is determined to overcome by directing this couple's attention back to the scriptures. Verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. The consistency with which the church has resisted this redirection of its attention back to Israel's scriptures is truly remarkable. I remember a bishop telling us that the Nishka tribe of British Columbia had a much better creation story than Genesis. That may well be, but Christianity that forsakes the Jewish scriptures for alternate, more current, more relevant, more entertaining, more interesting mythologies and histories has ceased to be Christianity, whatever it may profess. Likewise, a Gentile Jesus, an Asian Jesus, a black Jesus, a female Jesus, let alone an Anglican Jesus. None of these is Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Jew, Jesus the Christ. Back to our text. Walking the seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, Jesus had time to spell out for his companions the things about himself in all the scriptures the constantly repeated pattern of Israel's suffering and deliverance, recapitulated in his own person. That extended exposition of Israel's scriptures answers his own rhetorical question, verse 26, was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Jesus is preparing the way for his disciples and for us, radically to reassess his crucifixion, to know his passion and cruel death, no longer as cause for dejection, but rather as, using his own word, necessary to God's redemptive purpose for the world. To repeat Jesus' question, was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Reflecting back on their journey after their eyes have been opened to the identity of their companions, and Luke records Cleopas and wife, his wife's memorable words. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? But we're not quite there yet. For now, Jesus remains a stranger to them. They arrive at their destination, Jesus making as if to continue on his journey. The couple invite him, or as St. Luke tells us, urge him strongly to stay with them, because it's almost evening, the day is now nearly over. Jesus accepts. And verse 30, when he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. The guest becomes the host. And in language that mirrors that of the Last Supper, his actions with the bread open their eyes to recognize him at last. The whole day's experience, the risen Lord's bringing them to this moment of illumination and insight. Ever since that day, the church has been unable to read St. Luke's account without finding it a wonderful and illuminating archetype of the sacramental mystery of the Holy Eucharist. Jesus comes to us, is really present with us in word and sacrament, giving himself to be recognized by the eyes of faith, your eyes, my eyes. Yet even as Jesus gives himself to us, he's never simply at our disposal. 
just as he wasn't at this couple's disposal, coming upon them suddenly and equally suddenly vanishing from their sight. Jesus is the Lord, and not we ourselves. He presides over us, never us over him, however hard we try. May we know our risen Lord present with us now, as together we receive in bread and wine his body and his blood. To the glory of our holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. and say together with me, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, through whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For peace from on high and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For our bishops, Susan and Colin, and for our clergy, David, Harry and Patrick, and all the people, David, Sarah, and Patrick, and all the people, let us pray to the Lord. For Charles, our King, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. For this town of Oakville, for every city and community, and for those who live in them in faith, let us pray to the Lord for good weather and for abundant harvest for all to share, let us pray to the Lord. For those who travel by land, water, or air, for the sick and the suffering, 
for prisoners and captives, and for their safety, health, and salvation. For those who have asked for our prayers today, Miski, Mary, Bruce, James, Fred, Kevin, Marlene, Kate, Janet, Lindsay, Madison, Justin, Stephanie, Saunders, Julie, Judy, Alistair, David, Carol, Viola Cleo, Alan, Cordelia, Debbie and family, Michael, Doreen, Peggy, Kathy, Ashley, and Moira. May they be comforted and strengthened. Let us also remember before you, Holy Spirit, out loud or in our hearts, all those personally known to us. Let us pray to the Lord. For our deliverance from all affliction, strife, and need, let us pray to the Lord. For the absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, let us pray to the Lord. For all who have died, let us pray to the Lord. Remembering all the saints, we commit ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our God. Almighty God, who has given, given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt hear their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. For thou, Father, art good and loving. We glorify thee through thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things and judge of all people, we acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty. We do earnestly repent heartily sorry for these our misdoings. Most merciful Father, for thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all them that with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen invite you to stand. Hallelujah! Christ has been raised from the dead. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
God, our strength and salvation, receive all we offer you this day and grant that we who have confessed your name and received new life in baptism may live in the joy of his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with Lift up your hearts. Lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord. Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God, creator and preserver of all things, but chiefly are we bound to praise thee for the glorious resurrection of thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, for he is the very Paschal Lamb which was offered for us and hath taken away the sin of the world, who by his death hath destroyed death, and by his rising to life again hath restored to us everlasting life. Therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Blessing and glory and thanksgiving be unto the Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to take our nature upon him and to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memorial of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee and grant that we, receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution and in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. Who, in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, we, thy humble servants, with all thy holy church, remembering the precious death of thy beloved Son, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again in glory, do make before thee in this sacrament of the holy bread of eternal life and the cup of everlasting salvation the memorial which he hath commanded. We praise thee, we bless thee, we thank thee, and we pray to thee. Lord our God. And we entirely desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, 
we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And we pray that by the power of thy Holy Spirit, all we who are partakers of this holy communion may be fulfilled with thy grace and heavenly benediction. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And as our Savior Christ has taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, I invite you in this moment, wherever you may be, to receive Christ in communion with the saints and the gathering of God's people, unseen and yet present with us now. In Christ's body, many are made one. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold of great mercy. We are not worthy so much as to gather at the crumbs under thy table. But thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, to drink his blood, that we may be one dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us.
God of life, bring us to the glory of the resurrection promised in this Easter sacrament. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Go in peace. Proclaim the good news. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Alleluia. Alleluia. And just before we sing the last hymn, I do want to say, Susan, that I know it said Harry in the prayers there, and you said it and then realized no. But it seems to me in this Wednesday after Easter day that Harry's name should be mentioned as alive is wonderful and uh, calls back the memory of a, a dear, dear man who is with our risen Lord in glory. And uh, thanks be to God. Sarah hasn't changed her name to Harry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>